Snow leopards are well-known denizens of the mountain ranges of Asia, inhabiting some of the most inhospitable and mountainous areas on Earth when it comes to the Himalayas and the Tibetan Plateau. How they became adapted to these extreme environments has however remained overlooked and unexplored, which is mostly due in part to the scant fossil records in the areas that they're found in. They are, after all, not the most ideal places for fossilization to occur given they lack the reliable burial opportunities and also have rapidly shifting environmental conditions. This was until now, with a new paper led by an international team of scientists, mainly from the Nova School of Science and Technology, examining how snow leopards came to be present in the environments we know them in today, alongside the re-examining of some previously discovered material which has found that their range was a good deal more expansive than was thought. Several potential records of ancient snow leopards are known of from both northern China and Europe, some thought to be more likely to belong to them than others though this study has described one that is much more confidently identifiable as one that I'll discuss in more detail in due time. This redescription of material from Portugal of all places, which were originally thought to be from a subspecies of extinct leopards, which have now been reclassified to in fact be a newly known subspecies of snow leopards, which is among the most surprising revelations presented in the study. Named as Panthera uncia lusitana, these remains, recovered in the early 2000s and published in 2006 as the Manga Lago Leopards, featured a well-preserved skull which was examined for this study, and had some features that did not quite match up with what would be expected for a leopard, as was first thought. The researchers were able to confidently place a specimen within the snow leopard species of P. Uncia due to the traits that the rest of the research paper was focused on, and there was sure a lot that was covered. With these anatomical features in mind, it made it easier for other known big cat remains to be more reliably identified as being snow leopard in origin, with it being clear that they dispersed outside of their main range of the Tibetan Plateau multiple times over the last two million years during the Quaternary. Examining five specimens attributed to ancient snow leopards found throughout Asia and Europe, their given anatomical traits and slight differences were examined using morphometric approaches, which sought to examine how the traits that have come to be in modern snow leopards came about over time, and also as to roughly when they developed and what it means for their ecology. Along with that, a species distribution model was also used to assess their potential past distribution during the last glacial maximum, and then comparing it to the locations in the fossil record to see if the past snow leopard lineages were equivalent in their range and therefore habits to their living counterparts. Guessing into their anatomical traits, identifying which cat specimens are snow leopards at all is a challenge if you don't know what to look for, which is particularly the case with their skeletons. Lions and tigers, for instance, being a notorious example of while having very distinct coats and physical features, their skeletons themselves look practically identical by some minor differences, particularly in their skulls. If both these big cats were both extinct and with no modern analogues, there is very little doubt that we would never get close to reconstructing their marked differences, and instead would be depicted rather similarly based on them being under the same genus of Panthera. A fun fact that isn't necessarily relevant, but is neat to know, is that snow leopards' closest relatives aren't actually other leopards despite sharing a common name, but actually tigers, with them forming a sister group together, with their common ancestor having diverged from other big cats around 3 million years ago with tigers and snow leopards then splitting off from each other around 500,000 years later. Getting back into the study, in terms of determining what remains belonged to either cave leopards or snow leopards, a close examination of their anatomy had to be done across a multitude of criteria to ascertain what the differences were. Snow leopards, especially down to the colder and more mountainous habitats, do have some marked differences skeletally across their body. Their limbs are proportionally more powerful and robust, which, along with having longer tails, allows them to better navigate and balance themselves in their rocky and uneven habitats. There are also a good few differences in their skulls as well that show how different they are from one another. Snow leopard skulls are a good deal higher and taller, with them also having a more domed forehead. Their sinus region is also greatly enlarged when compared to other big cats, which is suggested in most carnivorous mammals like hyenas to allow them to resist high stresses when biting on hard objects. This is however doubted to be the case in snow leopards though, as their frontal sinuses are both not as expanded at their back, and their cheek teeth are not considered robust enough. Instead, similar to cheetahs, their expanded sinuses instead function best at regulating air that they respire, for snow leopards being able to best warm the cold air around them, alongside more efficient heat dissipation while running, something which is very important when living in such low oxygen environments, where every breath needs to be maximised. 
the orbits where their eyes sit are also much larger than other big cats, which coupled with a more forward-facing orientation, which alongside a shorter nose, allows for better binocular vision than most other cats, which helps them in perceiving just how far away prey is located based on the relative position of them in their eyes, which is super useful for coordination given their habitats. They also have an enlarged, exotympanic chamber, which is a cranial structure associated with better hearing, which helps them in hearing rock crumbles as to where prey could be hiding. The jaws of snow leopards being more robust, coupled with their larger teeth, does give them a stronger but slower bite when compared to leopards, which is useful for them when it comes to bringing down their robust prey like mountain goats and bighorn sheep, whereas leopards have adapted for more quickly dispatching swifter and more gracile prey like gazelles and monkeys. To see how all of these traits developed over time, the researchers looked at and identified five distinct snow leopard fossils, the oldest being one million years old from sites in China, France, as well as Portugal. What was found was that all of the traits mentioned earlier rapidly developed over this timescale, something which also correlated with the glacial periods during the last ice age. And these other specimens, while indeed being identifiable as snow leopards, did have some differences compared to the modern population. For instance, P. Anchia lustina, the newly described subspecies, shows some discrepancies, including that they have a less concave forehead, as well as the mandibular corpus, the part of the jaw which anchors the teeth, was much deeper than in living snow leopards, which indicates that their feeding preferences may well have been different in some ways too. In terms of their adaptations over time, there are two key periods that could be noted, the first one extending from the early through mid Pleistocene. The snow leopards of this period of time were beginning to exhibit more raised hips, which is suitable for moving along more rough terrain, though the rostrums are still quite long, with their cheek teeth also not being robust. The second period, encompassing the late middle Pleistocene through to today, generally have the same traits as in the modern snow leopards, with this transition being marked by the onset of mass glaciation in the Tibetan Plateau during this time. This dry climate also enabled their prey of Caproni bovids to spread over wider areas, which of course their predators, in this case snow leopards, would also sensibly do so as well to follow them. What seems to have enabled their movements over to Portugal and across Europe was that during the intensifications of glaciations across Eurasia, more open grassland spaces were formed due to the colder climates and ecological shifts, which made it easier for them to spread given they prefer these kind of environments. This led to the researchers involved to conclude that high altitudes and snow environments are not the limiting factor of the species' distribution, but rather the presence of accommodating open and hilly spaces. With all of this now better understood, as well as knowing that snow leopards used to range as far as Portugal, this is hugely relevant and important knowledge, not just of the past, but also for today as well. With fewer than 10,000 adults remaining in the wilds, Knowing where they could range and where they could be relocated to in the future is very much important to understand, and knowing that from their past, their distribution seems more predicated on the presence of mountainous regions with heavy rock cover rather than the temperature and altitude there, which is critical to knowing where and how they can most effectively be protected. Overall, this paper really makes clear the importance of reassessing materials stored in museums, alongside the strengths of international collaboration with the Portugal snow leopards only being found out to be one through the contextualization with other materials that were provided and worked with from China. The researchers involved are also planning on a follow-up study on this one, which apparently features a ton of CT scans and molecular paleontology, so expect a sequel to this video to come out eventually. And to leave things off with a bit of a mystery, this famous leopard painting from Chauvet Cave in southeastern France long thought to be solidly a cave leopard, could instead represent a snow leopard instead. The drawing has a spotless belly, something which is also found in snow leopards, though their tails are also quite thin, which is very much unlike the thick, bushy ones that are well known in them. Cave lion art from the same area also have these same thin tails, so that could well just be a stylization choice, and something that also could track to the spotless underside. Knowing that they were at least in these regions does regardless call into question at just what subjects these artists were depicting, and given how generally detailed they are, they are worth examining given they give us one of the most tantalising views into a long dead world that we are still finding out more on to this very day. All in all, I thank you for watching this video on these animals, and that you may have learned something new. If you would like to see more from this channel, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. And with that, I'll see you next time, whenever that may be.